and action. Okay. Well, this is my roof. Um, it's on 58th Street, and you know, I don't. I, I'm bored of New York. I'm really, really bored. So I don't usually go above 59th Street or below 57th Street unless it's the Kennedy Airport. But on the roof has been like a lot of people. Um, the original publicity photos for Alice Cooper taken right over here. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I can't even name how many people. It's like everybody who ever made a record. Um, this is bullshit. Um, but they come in the house, they drink my soda. Sometimes they bring like, you know, illegal substances. Um, you know, we're not supposed to be on the roof because the landlady locks it because there's insurance liability. If somebody falls off this roof, she's going to have to pay millions and millions of dollars, Bolshoi Dinghi, to their surviving relatives and, you know, maybe employer. Um, but anyway, this is um, a very interesting neighborhood. The roof is between two of the biggest hotels in New York. This is the, uh, what's that? Oh yeah, it's the Park Lane Hotel. It's falling down. That's why you have all these construction guys going up and down, mending it. And over here is the Plaza Hotel, one of the most famous landmarks in any movie you ever saw that's made in New York has this hotel in it. Um, they used, they turned it in, it's not a hotel anymore. They turned it into what's called a condo where they sell apartments. One of the apartments sold for $93 million. Yeah, to some Russian guy. He doesn't even stay there. He just, I don't know, he's, I know better than to go down to the bar at the plaza and pick up Russian girls. It's about 40% of the condos were bought by Russian guys for their girls. Um, <laughs> no, I don't drink. I don't go to bars. I don't, you know, I go to... Go to Moscow. Um, what am I supposed to say? Well, yeah, give me some. Which, um, with whom you work? With whom I work? I work at home. Wait, I don't wait. have to get dressed. Okay. What, what this? What this? What this uh, place like? Exactly. Not in the room, but right next to the room. What this place created? Like, what, 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 what did you create it? Talk about your business. And by well, I got involved in Russia because um, I was playing with satellites and one day a satellite right on this roof I had a big dish and over in this direction are all the satellites but I didn't know that and all the satellites were blocked by these buildings that's Rockefeller Center and since I didn't know anything I started pointing the dish up and down and sideways and left and right and all of a sudden my TV screen lit, lit up with backwards R's and backwards N's and I went, whoa, what is that? And well, little by little I realized it was a Russian satellite right over our heads here. And this is back in around 1984. Very exciting. Um, and then I, you know, I got interested in Russia and I, I made like a hundred trips to Russia, maybe more, and doing different kind of, you know, troublemaking and uh, brought Boris Grabenchikov uh, to the States. He stayed here in the living room. And one of the coolest things anybody ever said to me, I mean, John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, everybody's been in there, but Grabenchikov, he's the master. One day after Boris on his first trip, he was here for a week and then we went to Los Angeles and he got to meet all his, you know, favorite musicians, you know, George Harrison and Tom Petty and Chrissy Hind and well, everybody. Um, and he stayed in my house for like a week on the couch in the living room. And on the last day in New York, he comes up to me and he goes, I can't do this very well. Um, he goes, Kenichka, there's something very interesting. He scratches his head a little bit. I've stayed in your home now for one week and I know your background in music. And in one week, not one time, have I heard you put music. This is very interesting, I don't understand. 
Uh, okay, so I, I, I was able to go, no, Boris, Boris, you know, I got I'm more than 40 years old and there's, there's, my hearing is crummy and, you know, there's too much shit in my head and, you know, I don't hear it the way I used to hear it. When I used to hear music, it was my whole body and, you know, it was, and then a few years ago, it's, it's, I stopped hearing it that way. It just came in through my ears and that was inter interesting to me. That wasn't interesting to me, so I just, um, I guess I just, it, it fell off when I stopped listening to music so much. And he goes, mm -hmm, uh -huh, uh -huh. so he's listening to my excuse about too much shit in my head and tinnitus and, you know, that's ringing ears and deafness from being on stage too much. Oh. So he somehow convinces me to make a little, I'm an electronic guy make a little switch where it silently would switch between a plastinky acetate LP record and a CD. So we got the same song queued up perfectly on the CD and on the LP and go boom. And okay, we started closing our eyes and he would turn the switch. And I was very surprised at the difference. I mean, every time it was on the plastinky, my whole body, my whole is a full body experience. And every time he put it on this CD, it only went through my ears and wasn't very interesting. So then that's not over yet. Uh -uh. You gotta stay for the punchline. Then he looks at me very wisely and he goes, Kenichka, if, you, if music is infinite, is music infinite? Okay, he knows in the back of your head you're answering, oh, of course music is infinite. If music is infinite and you reduce to 1,024 points, do you not lose something? So that, out, of all the, out of all the traffic in and out of the house, I think that was the most memorable line. It's, 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 it's even more outstanding than the time I had my friend Donald staying here. He lives in Los Angeles, was a music publisher. And he published the music for, oh, every one of the Jamaican bands, all the reggae bands. And this is back in the uh, late 70s or early 80s. And we used to have a deal, tu casa es mi casa, tu doma mi doma, you know, moi doma, ha ha. So when I went to California, his house was my house. When he came to New York, my house was his house. Okay, that worked great for years. Well, one day he got back from Jamaica and instead of going back to Los Angeles, he stopped in New York and there he is on the couch. And um, it was like a Tuesday afternoon and he's out doing some business meetings. And, um, you know, he was out. So I was out too. I got back home at three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon and I come in my house, key, walk a few steps, go up upstairs and go around and turn the corner and go in my bedroom. And I had a couch, the couch, Divan. <laughs> and in there, there was this guy sitting there. And he's looking right through my head. He could see the back of my head. And it scared the shit out of me and I ran out of my own house. And if I ever wrote an autobiography, it would be called The Moment I Met Marley. Yeah. And that was Bob Marley. Uh, who, when Donald had dinner with him that night and came home, he says, Bob really liked you. Which, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, How about John Lennon and your guitar? Well, I built John Lennon's last guitar. Um, it was a very funny guitar because, well, a long time ago I invented the wireless guitar. That means like no cord and you can run around and no strings attached. Um, and one day I had a guy working for me who actually made guitars. See, I made the radio part, the wireless, and then I had a guy come in and he worked with me making guitars. We designed a guitar that looked like the Romulan spaceship in Star Trek. A little rectangular body with two outriggers 
and inside I put every kind of electronics you can imagine. This was before people had fuzz boxes and wah-wah pedals and this guitar was loaded. And we sold three of them. We sold one to Jeff Lynn from Electric Light Orchestra, one to Bootsy Collins, bass player, that was a bass, and one to um, John Lennon. Okay, fine. And well, you know, we sold the guitar to John, and um, one day I got a phone call, and it was John's personal assistant, Fred Seaman. And he says, John would like you to come to our new house. I mean, they moved into a house on 72nd Street, the Dakota, and designed the stereo system. Now, look, I'm, I'm making very complex equipment here, and I, my first response was, hey, Fred, look, I don't do stereos. You know, go to the store and, you know. But then I thought again, and it was, well, John Lennon, okay, I'll design his stereo, all right, all right. <laughs> Not that I knew that much about stereos, to be truthful. Um, so I go up to the house in, in this very crazy building and walk into the apartment and right opposite the front door was Central Park, windows all, and between the door and the windows were all these sarcophaguses, these Egyptian mummies laying in boxes. Oh, I never asked for an explanation, it was very, very weird. And, okay, so we do a little survey of the place where speakers might go and where the equipment should be. And then finally we go into the bedroom. Bedroom is a wee little bedroom. Little, little. And there was just in it a bed. And a window over Central Park and just a little bedroom. And over the bed hanging vertically was my guitar. And I think Fred could feel my heart sink. I looked at the guitar on the wall and I said, he uses it as a wall ornament? This is very disturbing. And he was very quick to reply, no, Kenny, he, he, he loves it so much he sleeps under it. And that was the guitar that was used on his last album, Double Fantasy. Um, John had been up here once to buy, I had this contraption, uh, it was a Seagram's company, Seagram's album jukebox, and it would take 50 plastinkies, and it was the most crazy thing you ever saw, clunk, 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 click, click, clunk, clunk, before transistors and integrated circuits. Well, you'd have round telephone dials, rotary dials, you've heard of them. <laughs> It had rotary dials and you would go around the house and you would dial number 69 and this thing would go and one time out of four it would take record number 69 and start to play it. So I had inherited this from a guy who was, well anyway, um, um, I rebuilt this thing and it, it, it almost worked. It, it worked. It worked okay. Um, and John came to look at this thing because he heard that it was for sale because I was, you know, was selling it. And you know, he came with an advisor, a business advisor. And you know, he spent some time in the bedroom just hanging out and laying on the floor and doing things that people did in the late 70s. And uh, his business advisor convinced him I, it was too expensive. I wanted all of $1,500 for the thing, and it was one of 30 in the world. Completely rebuilt, better than new, and his business advisor convinced him that it was too expensive. John had even made a drawing, he even had made a drawing of the place between his hallway and his kitchen where this thing would go. It was kind of big, you know, cabinet. He even made a drawing of this cabinet in its place. And I realize now, I mean, this is very mercenary, but I should have said, yeah, give me the drawing, you can have the thing. But I failed to do that. I also, yeah, I also owned the artwork to the Imagine album, this big um, 
rectangular vertical kind of thing with clouds and lots of clouds and everybody knows it now from imagine this and imagine that and I owned that and there was my friend Donald in California I had moved to California for a short period of time it's so boring there every day it was the same I came back here after nine months um, but I had the painting and I needed 25 bucks I'm sorry 35 and I asked Donald for the 35 bucks yeah give me 35 bucks well, I'll have it soon <laughs> and, you know, he, he says okay well, uh, uh, he had his eye on the painting I said okay you can hang on to the painting until I pay you back the $35 and well there was a few months well it was a while before I had that much money and I went to return it to Don give me the painting it turned out Don had sold it to Artie for 150 bucks and well it was sort of still in the family okay um, uh, later, Donald somehow got it back from Artie, and he, he's real crazy, and what he did, he's a music publisher. He publishes the music of Hendrix and Chicago and a few other bands, Marley, of course. And he had his eye on getting the publishing for John Lennon's catalog, and he decided if he gave the painting which he had appraised, he had it appraised, it was now sixty, seventy thousand dollars and that was, woo! If he gave the painting to Yoko, she would give him John Lennon's publishing and Donald, you're out of your fucking bird Will you? <laughs> well, he spent five thousand dollars to restore the painting to its original condition because I forgot to mention I had I'd learned how to fly airplanes, little, little one, pop, 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 you know, with weed whacker motors. Um, I learned how to fly airplanes in, during the nine months I lived in California. It was the only productive thing I did. And um, because I was very excited about airplanes, I had cut all these airplanes out of the flying magazine. And I used rubber cement to put them on top of the painting around the clouds. And no disrespect intended, but, you know, clouds and airplanes and it was nice well that's how the painting was I guess when I gave it to Donald for the 35 bucks well he got it back from Artie he paid five thousand dollars to restore it and get my airplanes off it um, and he gave it to Yoko I didn't think he was gonna really do it who could be so stupid and, but Yoko actually was very generous. She actually reimbursed him the $5,000 and Don gave me 2500 half. So I did pretty good, $35 to 25 And uh, Yoko has the painting now. <laughs> Unless she sold it for like $2 million, who knows. <laughs> uh, am I out of breath yet? How about the, the Imagine Project? Oh, the Imagine Project. Yeah, well, one of the... I'm an inventor, and this is my misfortune, because I tend to invent a lot of things, and the more things you invent, the more inventions you get. And it's, it's very, very um, hard to stay focused. But then one day, an idea came to me. This is long after John died. Actually, this would be about mm, 2002, 2003, about 12 years after John died. Um, I was already going back and forth to Russia a lot, and we had started a communications company that um, did communication satellites for different Western companies who wanted to work in Russia and Kazakhstan. And, um, you know, in doing so, I had some people working for my company came from the Soviet space program uh, you know these were you know we, we were able to cherry pick really great guys um, and um, one of these guys once told me the story about Yuri Gagarin when they opened the hatch after he landed oh it was very terrible uh, <laughs> we won't go there <laughs> um, well okay so I had this idea 
let's take one of John Lennon's guitars. And it doesn't have to be the guitar that I did. It's not important. He probably had a hundred guitars. Let's take an official John Lennon guitar. We'll stuff it with a digital recording of Imagine, the song, Imagine There's No Country. And we'll put a shortwave transmitter inside it, just like Sputnik, the original Sputnik transmitted on 21.005 megahertz. And we would do the same thing, except it would play Imagine as it went all over the world. Now, dig, in, in 2002, 2003, this was still very exciting that, to think like a dozen years ago, John Lennon, you know, was assassinated and probably the last thing in his mind was that... That was 96. What? That, not 2003. Oh, yeah? In 1996, Kiba was one years old. Oh, okay, so 1996. <laughs> Little did I remember. <laughs> what time is it? Okay. <laughs> anyway. So we had this idea and you know it was incredible because when John died um, when he was assassinated in um, 1990, 1980, oh shit, um, nobody would have ever imagined that the United States and Soviet Union would ever you know do anything but scare each other you know and it probably you know the changes were probably something that would be very thrilling to him so, I mean, especially if he writes a song like that, imagine there's no countries and no religions, too. Um, so we were going to take the, the chipset, you're going to take the little digital recording of Imagine, the transmitter, stuff it into a John Lennon guitar, and we got cooperation. We got agreement from the Russian Space Agency to carry it up to Mir. And in Mir, you know, these guys were not doing very much for a lot of the time. So they were playing guitar and um, they were playing and singing Beatles songs, you know, all the time they'd be going around singing Beatles songs and nobody knew. So here would come John Lennon's guitar, he would go into the space station and the guys would play a little bit for the camera. She loves you, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then they would do an extravehicular activity where they put on the spacesuit and they'd go out in space with this guitar and they would play, well, we call it air guitar, like I'm playing air guitar now. You see, I have no guitar. This is called air guitar. They would play airless guitar and then they'd take the guitar and just throw it as far as they could away from the mirror and it would go into its own orbit and be logged in the international logbook or whatever as the, the, the satellite Imagine 1. Anyway, um, in Russia, everybody loved the idea. Um, we even had one astronaut, cosmonaut. Uh, okay. uh, in Russia, everybody loved the idea, the official guys, the not official guys. In fact, one cosmonaut from Kazakhstan, he got off the plane in Almaty or Almaty, whatever it was then, and was met by the press and he announced that he was going to take John Lennon's guitar to Mir and that was printed in the Kazakhstan newspapers and well now we came back to New York I came back I tried to get the guitar and um, I mean I've got to apologize to Yoko Ono because I went through a friend of ours um, who was doing business with Yoko Ono's lawyer and brought this beautiful proposal that we made with letters from Russia and letters from official America. A beautiful proposal for this beautiful idea. And we gave it to this lawyer who sees his client Yoko every week, every day. And he would present her the proposal. And then the word came back a couple of weeks later that the lawyer, the advocate, said that Yoko didn't think it was an interesting enough idea to deserve one of John's guitars. And the, the fact is, I, I, I really had terrible things to say about Yoko for 10 or 12 years. I mean, I went around really not liking her. What a bitch. Hmm. Until one day I realized that I never saw her say no. It was the lawyer who said she said no, and the lawyer was a pussy. 
the last question. Where so Yoko, you might be, Yoko may be okay. But listen, we can't do the idea anymore now that the, um, you know, so many guys, civilians have flown in space and that they launch a 15 foot Pepsi container. This would be. Where you would love to live beside New York or only New York? Do you have, imagine only if you not. have. Huh? Only not. Only not. Only not. Or not New York, or you will live in New York. Oh, great for you. Well. No, I, I, I've used up New York. I mean, I've lived here, you know, been headquartered here all my life. And, you know, like any place, you know, if you live there all your life, it's sort of a big deal. You know, so, I mean, it's a lot of fun when I meet people who just come off the plane from, you know, somewhere in Siberia or somewhere in Illinois. You know, you know, it's very exciting through their eyes, but even that's getting boring because there have been so many of those people. Um, I'd, if I could, I'd live in St. Petersburg. Um, but I wouldn't do it if I couldn't speak Russian. Because I think to live someplace where you don't speak the language is like both embarrassing and insulting. <laughs> and I just don't have a brain to speak Russian. I could say things like, I could say, You know, I could say a few, you know, really stupid things, but um, I don't do very well with the language. And otherwise, I think St. Petersburg is a place for me because it's such a powerful energy there and a very beautiful energy. It's very beautiful and very tragic. Am I through? Well, besides, if, so I guess it's just, just only one place for you to live. It's in it's New York. If you feel a lot of Russian. Well, that's that's very logical. I don't get it. <laughs> no, I mean. I, I don't use New York the way other people like, you know, come and they go to Broadway shows and fabulous restaurants and, you know, fantastic A-list parties. Yeah. And, you know, I've done all that. You know, thanks. I'd rather sit at home with a bowl of cornflakes and, you know, go to St. Petersburg and have some Zakuski. Um, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't go to St. Petersburg for 15 years. I was afraid to. No, not 15. I used to go to St. Petersburg starting around 19, I guess my first time in 1985-86. And I got really serious in 87 and 88 when I worked with Boris and Aquarium. Um, and you know, every time I'd come back from St. Petersburg, I'd be like on a stretcher or in a body bag. Something about the energy of the place would drive me mad. And I had a policy for 10 years, I refused to go there. As much as I loved it, I, I just couldn't handle it. Um, and then it was around to the year 2000, you know, 10 years later, that I went and all of a sudden it had an opposite effect. And you know, I wasn't scared of it anymore. <laughs> and uh, I like it a lot more than Moscow. Who? Oh, well, the Moscow people are going to really hate me. <laughs> uh. <laughs>